really serious, and any cancer can be serious. Uh, and if you would, I want to encourage everybody to consider fasting this week. Find a day where you can, you know, uh, fast from food, uh, and you know, and just seek the Lord on on her behalf. Amen. Also, pray during that fast for others who are sick that you know about from the prayer sheet, from what have you. Dominic, uh, uh, is Dominic here? Just say, raise your hand. Over there, so you know Dominic and Teresa. Can you guys stand up and kind of circle around twice? No, I'm just kidding you. <laughs> he just had a heart attack. I felt bad because it was right after the home group that I did. He got home, and then he found out he had a heart attack later, you know. And uh, so... Uh, praise God he's here. That's good news. <laughs> but pray for him as well. Amen. And Teresa and everybody else you know that's in need. Any marriages that are struggling, any kids that are struggling, just pray for whatever, you know, is on your heart. Amen. Your own walk with the Lord. And find a day to fast and pray this week. And uh, my wife and I are going to do that. And hopefully you'll join us. Sometimes we'll pick a specific day, but we realize it's hard for certain people. They could have important lunch meetings or whatever on that day. So Sometimes I like to just say, hey, pick a day yourself that fits in your schedule. And if it's not a whole day, you know, fast for a meal. Amen? And spend time during that meal uh, praying and interceding. Amen? All right. Uh, we're leaving off because we're doing a chapter break of Revelation. And I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 5. And uh, like I said, whether you're married or not, or to be married, definitely as well, uh, this is going to apply to you uh, because it has to do with a key principle that's taught in the Word of God but not commonly taught from modern pulpits, popular radio and TV preachers. Not that it's never covered, but when we deal with marriage, I can tell you right now, I don't think I've ever heard preached a message that put the marriage and the fear of God together. Uh, but at the same time, when I do marriage counseling and premarital counseling, I cover this ground. I'm going to cover a lot more ground than I do in a uh, premarital counseling regarding the fear of God, but that's usually part of my message. Some of you might be thinking, well, his daughter is getting married this month, so, you know, uh, he's preaching on the fear of God, to, and his niece, Tori, will be getting married sometime in, you know, next or later on this year. Uh, I'm not sure what month yet. I don't think they are. Uh, so he's trying to strike the fear of God in Brandon and, and, and Adam, and no, I've, I assure you, I've already struck the fear of God in Adam, and, <laughs> and Brandon, uh, his time will come. Uh, all kidding aside, uh, the, this uh, very, very serious subject is, is fearing God and, and knowing that we fear Him in our marriages. It's huge key. In fact, turn to the classic. If someone says, what's the classic marriage text in the New Testament, 99 out of 100 theologian, theologians uh, would probably say Ephesians chapter 5 if you're talking about the New Testament epistles. And I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Certainly Jesus had some crucial things to say about marriage in Matthew 19 and elsewhere. But right now, I want to hone in on a certain aspect of marriage. And like I said, this will apply to all of our lives. This could revolutionize and should revolutionize your walk with God. Unless you are already operating and walking in what this teaching is about, then it will simply strengthen you in your resolve to seek the Lord and be obedient to Him in the areas that He calls us to. Ephesians chapter 5, most preachers, and I understand why, in fact, most Bible, Bibles themselves, do you have a heading right before verse 22 in your Bibles? Do you? Yeah, so do I. It says, marriage like Christ and the church. And it starts out, wives be subject to one, your own husbands as to the Lord. So most people start right where their Bible heading starts when they look at this passage on marriage with a command for the wives to be submissive to their husbands. But I want to suggest to you that that's not the best place to start. The best place to start to really understand this whole passage would be to read the whole book of Ephesians, of course, but that's not our purpose to uh, exegete every verse in Ephesians chapter 5 on marriage. I want to hone in more on a topical aspect of this, but I suggest that the starting point is not 522. If you really want to look at this passage, you need to back up one verse. Verse 21. It says, and be what? Subject to who? One another in the what? In the fear of Christ. That's incredibly important because before he tells wives to be submissive to their husbands and follow their leadership and be obedient to them, he says to be subject to one another. That means wives are to be subject to their husbands, but 
Husbands are also supposed to be subject to one another, and in this context, as it follows, their wives. He explicates what that submission looks like for the wife. It's submission to the leadership of her husband, obedience to his leadership, unless she, he tells her to do something contrary to the will of God, and it's clear, clearly contrary to the will of God. For the husband, that submission looks like sacrificially loving his wife and laying his life down for her on a daily basis. Both have some pretty tough jobs. But when those commands are followed, a marriage is beautiful. When those commands are rebelled against, a marriage will struggle. A marriage will not be what God's called it to be. The joy will not be in that marriage the way it ought to be. That doesn't mean one can't follow and do what's right and have joy, but the marriage won't be with both of them full of joy. And that's really our objective ultimately is to make sure two people in a marriage covenant are both saved and sanctified and full of the Spirit and the joy of the Lord. So this passage, if I was going to preach through this passage, which I'm not going to preach through it today, I would emphasize verse 21 first, and I do that every time I do marriage counseling, I go to this passage, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. There's a mutual submission that goes on, husband and wife. And by the way, this heads a emphasis within Paul throughout much of the rest of this book, and certainly the rest of chapter 5 and the beginning of chapter 6, about not only husbands and wives being submissive to one another, but how servants are to be submissive to their masters, or in our context, employees to their bosses, and children are to be submissive to their parents. So this whole thing starts with, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. So it's that mutual submission, but it has to do with fearing God in the context of that submission. Recognizing God's presence in your life. Recognizing that we are accountable to the living God. In fact, it's interesting, uh, when I do premarital counseling, I encourage the young man or the young woman that think of it as though your in-laws are living with you. And they're seeing how you treat their daughter or their son. Would that change the way you talk to her? Chad actually does live with us, my son-in-law right now. Uh, that happens these days a lot, and I think it's a great way at times for young couples to save up and hopefully get into a home or what have you. But, uh, and Chad, I see he treats my daughter great, you know. But even more so than how you treat, now that should rectify or change or inspire <laughs> the way uh, one treats the other. If their in-laws are right there, or if they're living in the closet, listening to every word, ready to bust out any moment, you know. Uh, how much more should the fact that Jesus Christ is living in our homes affect us? The King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who that, to whom we will give an account. That should affect the way we treat one another, amen? If it doesn't, you are being foolish. <laughs> because if you're treating your wife or your husband harshly, Jesus is right there. And he's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he's to be feared. So this is important, a really, 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 really important subject, and I can't stress enough how important it is that we all understand and comprehend how important uh, this subject matter is. In fact, I think it's amazing because when I've studied, and this has been one of my uh, you know, pet peeves, this issue to study it because and understand it because I don't see it being preached. You can read any number of books on marriage and the fear of God. Uh, you most likely will not find a chapter you most likely will not even find a sentence on the fear of God. Yet that's the foundation of everything we're to do as believers. And especially the foundation of a successful walk with God and a successful marriage with the ones that, that is supposed to be the most important person in our lives after God is living in the fear of God. In fact, Psalm 127, or sorry, 127.1 says, unless the Lord builds a house, and except the uh, Lord watch the city. What does it say? Except the Lord watches the house or builds the house, the laborers labor in vain. You can build your house, but it's in vain if, you're not, if the Lord's not doing it. Except the, the, the watchmen, the Lord keeps the city, the watchmen walk in vain. They can look all they want, man, but their city is going to be destroyed if God is not the foundation. Ultimately, that was what will take place. Well, right after that psalm, it's a very short psalm, is another very short psalm, Psalm 128. And it talks about a blessed life. It talks about a husband and wife and children who are like a fruitful vine, uh, like, like a, a, a blossoming garden on the table of their house. And 
that depiction is bookmarked by two phrases or two concepts, the same concept really, but reiterated on both ends of that blessed household is the fear of God. Listen to this. Psalm 128. How blessed is everyone, it's not just for married people, how blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. When you, when you shall eat of the fruit of your hands, you will be happy and it will be well with you. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine within your house, your children like olive plants around your table. Behold, for thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. Catch that? Did you catch that? Fear the Lord is both sides of that. You want a blessed household? You need to fear the Lord. You need to fear God. Well, what if I'm fearing God, but it just doesn't turn out like that because, you know, my husband's rebellious or my wife's rebellious. Well, if you fear God and walk in him, you will still be blessed in the end. Amen? You want to make sure you're right with God. Do you do something, do, you do things foolishly because your wife does or your husband does or your, your children do? No, you have to fear God and walk with him still. But guess what? You get a husband and a wife that both fear God together, man. What a blessed household that will be. It's important that we understand that that bookmark, those bookmarks of fearing God, encapsulating, enveloping a, a blessed home, a blessed marriage, begins with the fear of God. We can't really have any wisdom and skills to live life successfully and be blessed if we don't fear God. Because the very beginning of wisdom begins with the fear of God. Job 28, 28 says, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to turn from evil is understanding. The book of Proverbs, which is all about how to skillfully live our lives, to be blessed by God, to glorify God, and to be a blessing to others, begins in chapter 1, verse 7 with, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. In fact, we get insight as to how the fear of the Lord gives us wisdom in Proverbs 9, 10, which says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. When you fear God, you gain great insight. Why? Because when you start to fear God, you recognize that He is ultimately in control and He's the one that we're accountable to and will answer to. You start to all of a sudden realize, wow, it's not about me, it's about Him you start to see things through his eyes. You start to look at his word. You start to understand his plan. And then you start to make decisions that are based on who he is and what his plan is. And by making the right decisions that glorify him, glorifies him, he is in your life and he blesses your life. In fact, uh, Psalm 111.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have good understanding. His praise endures forever. Notice how many times I've read scripture already. Let's say basically the same thing. If you don't fear God, you can't be wise spiritually. In fact, the fear of the Lord unlocks God's treasures to us. And God's treasures are far more valuable, the scriptures say over and over again, than silver and gold and the treasures of this world. Because they perish. They're gone in time. But knowing the Lord... Being in his kingdom, walking the streets of gold, having eternal life and being in eternal bliss and having his grace poured out on us from age to age is really where the treasure's at, amen? And it's not only the treasure in the next world, it's treasure right now because the Holy Spirit lives in us who believe. We have his word to guide us. We have God's protection and his wings spread over us. In fact, listen to this. Isaiah 33, verses five and six says, the Lord is exalted for he dwells on high. He will fill Zion with justice and righteousness. He will be, now listen to this, he will be the sure foundation for your times, a rich store of salvation and wisdom and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the key to this treasure. Did you catch that? The fear of the Lord is the key to this treasure. Many people, most people search in all the wrong places for treasure. Oh, they might get material treasure, but it's gone in time. But those who fear the Lord, just in the very beginning, wisdom opens up to them. And the treasures that God has, the one who made the entire universe, are opened up to us. That verse alone is just something you just want to meditate upon the rest of the service almost. But we got to talk about marriage, okay? Because we want that treasure to reach into our marriages. Amen? 
The book of Job speaks of how miners go through the depths of the earth. They penetrate through rocks and everything else to get precious minerals and gold and what have you. But they end up empty in regard to the wisdom of God because it's far more precious and it comes from God alone. In fact, Proverbs chapter 2, after it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, Proverbs chapter 2 says, my son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you, talks about how his life will be blessed. And he says, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures. We need to recognize that God's word is a treasure. And if we don't fear him and love him, we're not going to search his word and seek to apply it to our lives the way we ought to. Psalm 119.72 says, the law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of coins of gold and silver. I love that, man. Psalm 119. 162 says, I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure. So the fear of the Lord is beginning to wisdom and it unlocks treasure to us. But the fear of the Lord leads us to Jesus. You see, the Bible says God's law, which is written on everybody's heart, is a school teacher, a schoolmaster, really a, a, a pedagogue, a, a, a school nurse that would discipline you when you're young, that just as she would lead that child to maturity, God's law leads us to Christ, it says. So the fear of the Lord, because when you start to see God's law and that God's serious and that he's a just and righteous God and he punishes evil, what happens? You should wisely respond and say, wait a minute, man, I need to be right with God. And then when you recognize you're not right with God, you realize you need what? Forgiveness. And that should draw you to Jesus. The fear of the Lord brings such wisdom. The fear of the Lord brings such knowledge. Now, it's amazing because... The Bible tells us in Colossians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, that in Christ are all the treasures and, of wisdom and knowledge. Amen? It's all in him, man. He made the universe. And we come to Jesus. And we have the word, which is called the word of Christ. Amen? We have this incredible treasure, this roadmap into eternity, the straight and narrow road that leads to eternal life, as Jesus said. In fact, I had just heard recently of a woman this weekend who drove her car, got off the beaten path. Because, you see, God's word, man, it's, it's, it's you know, we talk about the instruction manual, but God, God's word is God's manufacturing handbook. It's God's instruction manual, amen? It's his roadmap. This lady got off and went, drove her car right through a shopping center, 80 feet through the aisles, hitting several people. Okay, just happened in Las Vegas. And that's very destructive. It's destructive when we are not on God's path. And we are not going to be on God's path the way we ought to be if we fail to fear the Lord. And I think that's so important to understand. In fact, it's interesting because the fear of the Lord, it says, the friendship of the Lord is with those who fear him and he makes his covenant known to them. Isn't that awesome? He makes his covenant known to him, them. And, you know, people think, oh, some people are unconditionally chosen for hell. God predestined them to damnation. He doesn't love a lot of people, or he loves them, but really he doesn't because he wants to damn them. And he predestines others in life, and they say it's just a mystery. No, it's not really a mystery. The Bible says the friendship of the Lord is with those who fear him, and he makes his covenant known to them. He gives grace to the humble. He resists the proud. If someone responds to his grace his providence, the witness in creation, the convicting of the Holy Spirit, and humbles himself, fears God, he makes his covenant known to them. What's his covenant? Ha, the ultimate covenant is that Jesus died for our sins, right? And he was buried and rose again. So when we fear the Lord, it opens up Jesus to us, the gospel, the good news, the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, amen? What an awesome, awesome, awesome reality. Now, and some people get the fear of God all wrong, you know? They think, well, why should I fear God? I thought he was good. That's exactly why you should fear God. The Bible says in Romans 13 that we should fear governing authorities. And when you go down, would you just drive here 95 miles an hour? You're late, hit the 95 miles an hour in the rain? Well, no, that's not safe. Well, what if it was safe? It's a clear day, no one's on the highway. Probably not because you don't want to get hauled off. I think there's a certain amount, you get past a certain, exceed a certain amount, you go right to jail, you know? Because you have some respect, some fear of the law. Is it because the law is evil? No. There's evil people in the law, but there's also good people. It's not because the law is evil, it's because you're evil, I'm evil. 
We fear God because he's good, because he's righteous, because he's justice, and we are fallen creatures prone to rebellion, and there's consequences because he is good and just where he'll punish the wicked. That's why we need to fear God. Amen? Well, I just want to love God. I, I can't but I love God. I really don't like to look at the fear of God. Well, the Bible says that we're supposed to consider the goodness and the severity of God, the apostle of grace. Paul said that. First Corinthians, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 8. Consider the goodness and the severity of God. When you consider the whole counsel of God, Paul said he is free from the blood of all men. He's not responsible for anyone's blood because he preached the whole counsel of God. He preached the love of God and the fear of God. Well, if I fear him at all, I can't really love him. That's ridiculous. You know why? Because you know what? I grew up as a kid and I feared my parents. They had a nice size switch and it worked really good. And I also loved them immensely. Can imagine not being with them, and I loved my parents growing up. As I got older, I got more rebellious, and you know the switch wasn't used as much. And then I became attuned with, wow, God's a radical God. I need to repent and get right, and repent of all this evil. And it led me to the treasures of His wisdom and the treasures of how to live a godly life and and be a godly husband that blesses my wife. And I'll tell you what, the fear of God is a good thing. And children fear their parents, but they still what? Love their parents, amen? So don't let anybody try to deceive you by saying you can't, because God, God says the fear of, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is everlasting. It's, for the, it's in the Old and the New Testament. Even the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, Revelation 14, when the eternal gospel is preached, the everlasting gospel, first thing that said is fear God. Fear of God is still there, and it's eternal. Because God will always be radically holy, just, beautiful, righteous, creator of all things, and will always be accountable to him. Amen? Now, the scriptures tell us in Isaiah 66, 2, I will bless those who have humble and contrite hearts, who tremble at my word. Uh, Philippians 2, 12 says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. I emphasize that because many people, and some Bible translations, want to take the word fear and they want to make it just respect. No, it's more than respect. Respect is there, no doubt. But respect and trembling doesn't fit, does it? The phobia, the Greek word, is where we get phobias from. That's the Greek word typically used to fear God. In other words, it means to be terrified of rebelling against him and the consequences. Well, how can I, how can I love him if I'm terrified of him? No, it doesn't mean that you're just terrified like, I'm running from him. It means yeah, in your heart, you need to reserve the, reserve the reality that if you are to rebel against him and give God the finger and say, I'm going to do my own thing, shine you, God, you are in huge trouble. And as long as you're abiding in him, amen, you have a sense of, you know what? I love him and I don't want to depart. Therefore, I have a sense of assurance, amen, and I have a sense of joy and security in the Lord. However, when you contemplate doing your own thing and committing apostasy, that concept of the fear of God, which should be alive in all of us, will hopefully kick in and keep you from transgressing. The scriptures talk about the foolish man who rejoices in his own mischievous, and when he's tempted, it says, with transgression, he doesn't fear God, and he rejoices in his, in his mischievousness. I thought, that's, man, that's like me when I was a little kid, and a lot of my little friends, man, we thought we were so crafty. Wow, we're going to get away with this. And the whole time, before we even had the thought, God already saw us, and he's right there. You know? We're not getting away with anything, folks. We need to be submitted to the one true God. Amen? Now, why should we fear God? What should that fear look like? Matthew chapter 28, verse 10. Jesus says, Don't fear those who can kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Who is Jesus warning there? Saved people or unsaved people? He's warning his apostles right there, folks. He tells them to fear God who can destroy their bodies in hell. In fact, Paul says in Romans chapter 11, the apostle of grace, 20 through 22, quite right, they were broken off, meaning the unbelieving Jews, uh, but you stand by your faith. You're standing by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear. There it is again. But fear, Why? For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Behold, then, the kindness and severity of God to those who fell severity, but to you, God's kindness. If you continue in his kindness, otherwise you also will be cut off. Folks, 
That's heavy. Jesus told his own elect apostles, don't fear man to destroy your body, but fear God to destroy your, souls and your body and soul in hell. Paul said, don't be conceited regarding your salvation, but fear, because just as God cut off the Jews that came to unbelief, you could also be cut off. So we're supposed to fear the consequences of rebelling against God. God. Now I can assure you that 90-some percent of radio preachers and TV preachers don't warn people that they could be cut off. And that's why the church is in such a lukewarm, pathetic state. And that's why the marriages in the church so often mirror the marriages in the world. Because there's no fear of God before their eyes. Are you with me? And there's a lot of people perishing that think they're saved. But they're in rebellion against God. You know, they're getting drunk. They're getting stoned. They're doing, you know, meth. They're doing, you know, there's a lot of professing Christians on heroin. You, you work with some of them maybe, you know. You wouldn't even know it until there's a you know, respiratory problem or, or in the addiction. There's all kinds of things going on all around us. But people that profess to love God, it, I see it. I see it because I'm in very much in touch with what's going on with the church, and it's in a very tragic state. And it starts with the pulpit. It starts with preachers needing to preach the fear of God and not preaching it. Amen? Now, uh, by the way, when the Scriptures tell us in the book of Hebrews chapter 12 that we're to serve God with fear and reverence, as Moses talks about how he shook the earth, but he's going to shake the heavens, and that we should be serving him with fear and reverence. He starts off that portion of the passage, uh, you know, actually, just before, actually early, even earlier, in chapter 10 and 11, you know, he talks about Noah moving with fear to put his family in an ark, to build an ark. He talks in chapter 10 about it being a fearful thing, to fall in the hands of the living God. If we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying judgment that will consume the adversaries of God. And he says it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. And then in chapter 12, when he talks about serving him with reverence and fear or, or awe, depending on the translation you're looking at, he starts off with how God treats us as children. And he loves us and he disciplines us. And we feared or respected our parents. How much more, should, it says, should we fear the Father of spirits and live? Amen? So God makes it analogous to children with their parents. And children that continue to rebel against their parents as they get older, I'm not talking about four or five, but I mean grown adults, and they continue to rebel, they're put out of the house. God is holy, thrice holy, and he needs to be recognized as such. Now it's interesting to me that in Matthew chapter 10, when Jesus says not to fear man who could destroy your body, but fear God who could destroy body and soul in hell in Matthew 10, 28, he goes on to say right after that in verse 29 and 30 and 31, are not two sparrows sold for one cent? And yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But the very hairs on your head are all numbered, so do not fear you are more valuable than many sparrows. I thought, isn't that interesting? Fear God, who can destroy your body and soul in hell. But do not fear, because your hairs are numbered and he cares for the sparrow that falls to the ground. What does he mean? I believe he's bringing those two concepts together. If you're right with God and your heart's with him, you don't have to fear judgment and condemnation. But at the same time, with that understanding, in your heart, you realize that if I rebel against God and I want to be my own God and I set myself up as my own God, he's a jealous God and he's the only true God and that would be a lie and I would need to be punished. In fact, we find a very similar thing in Exodus chapter 20. It says, Now when all the people perceived, and this was when Moses had just received the Ten Commandments and the mount was shaking there at Sinai in fire and smoke. Now when all the people perceived the thunderings and the lightnings and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled. And they stood afar off and said to Moses, You speak to us, we will hear you, but let not God speak to us, lest we die. And Moses said to the people, Do not fear. Listen to that. Do not fear, for God has come to prove you or test you, and that, that the fear of him may be before your eyes, that you may not sin. There's a bunch of scriptures. I, I've got a ton of scriptures, but I'm not going to share them today on how the fear of God keeps us from sin. You can imagine why, right? pretty much talking about that out of the context of that anyway. But here he says, ha, huh, he says, don't fear, but he's testing you that the fear of him may be, for, may be before your eyes so you will not sin. Don't fear, but fear. He's going to put the fear of God in you. What's going on there? 
The concept, again, is the same. The fear is the context of be concerned, be very concerned about what happens if you're a rebel against God. If you're, he that's not with me, Jesus says, is what? Against me. You know, if you become anti, if you're not for Christ, you're anti-Christ. Then you're under his judgment. But come to him, and then you'll have security and peace. Amen? Don't run from him. That's what you should fear, running from him. But don't fear being wrapped up in his loving arms. In fact, many, many scriptures verify this. Psalm 25, 14 says, The friendship of the Lord is, for those, is with those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. I've already quoted that, but that's also I want to emphasize now in that verse, the friendship of the Lord. Amen? Psalm 31, 19. How abundant is your goodness with those who you've laid up for those who fear thee and brought forth those who take refuge in thee. Wow. Psalm 33, 18. The eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his mercy. So if you fear him, his eye is on you. His mercy is on you. Amen? Psalm 34, 7 says, The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. You catch that? Psalm 103, 11. As the heavens are higher above the earth, so great is God's steadfast love toward those who fear him. Isn't that amazing? Verse 13. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. Psalm, I'm sorry, Isaiah 8, 13 says that the Lord of hosts, quote, let him be your fear. Now listen to this. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread, and he will become your sanctuary. Did he catch that? Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. It's a real fear. It's a real concern. It's not just respect. It's a trembling. And he will become your what? Your sanctuary. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. In other words, quit running in the street between all the cars because you're going to get destroyed and come to your father, you know, and he will embrace you and and be a sanctuary to you. But if you don't, you're going to suffer the consequences. It's not perfectly analogous, I know, because it also has to do with suffering his just desserts. But even our transgressions, the Bible says, a backslider is reproved by his own transgressions, the, the outcome of them in Jeremiah 3. It gets even better, though. Psalm 25, 14 says, the friendship of the Lord is with those who fear him, right? But it goes on to tell us that, that he unlocks all these wonderful treasures for us. Now, I began by saying the name of this message is the God-fearing marriage. And I personally believe that this message from God's word, you could throw away most of your books on, on Christian marriage if they are not emphasizing our responsibility before God in marriage. I, I don't not necessarily throw them away. There may be some really good books that just don't deal with this concept that have a lot of biblical principles. But what I'm saying is, if you don't fear God in your marriage, and you're trying to do all the other things, but you have a cavalier attitude about his holiness and being submitted to him and, and doing his will, the rest won't do you much good. That's my point. And I think it's interesting. What did I start off with? This passage, this classic text on marriage. Almost every Bible heading that has headings starts with verse 22. And I said, no, you need to back up verse 21 before it talks about the wife being submissive to her husband and be subject to one another in the what? Fear of Christ. Husband, can you honestly say that you're subjected to your wife in the fear of Christ? And wives, can you say that in regard to your submission to your husband, that you're fearing Christ, that you recognize that you will answer to him, husbands and wives. Now, I think it's interesting that the other classic text on marriage in the New Testament epistles, aside from Ephesians 5, is 1 Peter chapter 3. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. And I'm trying to show you even the successful husband and wife with their children in Psalm 128. It's all because of the fear of the Lord. It's at the root. And here in 1 Peter 3, the marriage text typically begins right here in verse 1. In the same way, you wives be submissive to your own husbands. Interesting. But guess what? That's where most people start again. Isn't it interesting? Both times it starts, it seems to start with the wife's submission, but really it doesn't because there's not a chapter break here in 1 Peter, in the original. It was written in Greek, and there were no chapters and verses. And the context of this actually starts much earlier 
the whole book gives it the greatest context, but as far as the submission context starts earlier. In fact, notice in, verse, in chapter 3, verse 1, it says, in the same way. In other words, it's related to something that's come before, amen? Back up to verse 17, and you'll see what comes before. Chapter 2, verse 17. What does it say in verse 17? Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. The fear part right there is God. And that begins, guess what? Just like Ephesians chapter 5, listen, don't miss this. Just like Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, kicked off being submitted to one another in the fear of Christ. And then it talks about the submission of children and, 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 and servants and husbands and wives. So this right here kicks off right here with this verse and goes into fearing God and then what? Being submitted one to another. Servants to masters, wives to husbands, husbands to wives. Same deal, guys. In fact, look at the very next verse. Servants what? Be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. In other words, hey, it's really hard. It might be easy to submit if someone's super sweet and nice, but when they're grouchy and grumpy and have consternation, and, and uh, not constipation, but consternation, you know, it can be a lot harder to submit to them. Would we agree? Yeah. And he's saying servants, Christians, he's not with Christian servants. You love Jesus now? The Roman Empire, I mean, a huge part of the populace was, was enslaved. Most of the Christians at this time were enslaved in many regions of the Roman Empire. And he wants them to be a good witness, amen? And hopefully win their masters over. And hopefully he says he wants them to get their freedom. And God did do that through the Christian faith eventually. But here he says, in this context, be a good witness. Be submissive, even if they're unreasonable. Now guess who he gives as an example? Drop down to verse 21. Just as Jesus becomes the example in Ephesians 5 for the husband to love his wife, we read in verse 21, For you have been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you what? An example for you to follow in his steps. He's our example. To follow in his steps, folks. Who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he what? He did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats and kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he, and he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness for by his wounds you were healed for you were continually strained like sheep but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. So Jesus in saving us saves, our, saves us from sin but also saves us so we can live righteously. How do we live righteously? We follow his example. We follow his steps. When he was reviled, when on the cross, did he revile back? When they said, get down from the cross if you're the son of God, did he, did he rip his arms off and call legions of angels just destroy everybody? No, he could have. But he suffered. And through the suffering, he brought the redemption of the world. And through our suffering and following his example, whether it's a servant, whether it's an employee, whether it's a husband, whether it's a wife, it can have a very redemptive effect as Jesus is seen in us and works through us. In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7 that a believer who's married to a non-believer, he says they could win them over. Isn't that why Jesus came? He came and died for your husband if your husband's not obedient to the word. He came and died for your wife. That's his main objective is to save us, not for us to have fun, not for us to say, wow, I had the best marriage ever. No, his objective is to win souls. And hopefully in the meantime, your marriage is blessed because you fear God. Amen? In fact, look at chapter 3 now. In the same way, you wives. What does that mean, folks? In the same way as those, as, as those servants were to be submissive to their, their masters, even when the masters were unreasonable. In the same way that Jesus was reviled, but did not revile back. You understand now? In the same way, beginning with what? The fear of God. In the same way you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their husbands. Did you catch that? Even if your husbands are disobedient to the word, they're godless. They don't follow God's word. Well, who was Jesus dying for on the cross? Not just his rebellious disciples who had denied him, but for those who were disobedient to the word. And what happened when he died for them? His attitude was, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. And our attitude should be one that doesn't revile back because you could win your husband over to Christ. 
well, I want to be involved in missions and winning souls and, and winning lost. Guess what? That's your first mission field, folks. Your own spouse, if they don't know the Lord, amen? And your children. And the best opportunity children have of coming to Christ is with the parents that stay together if they can, amen? And I say if they can, I do realize that in Matthew 19 that Jesus said, if a, a man divorces his wife and marries another, he commits adultery, except, he said, in the case of sexual sin, okay? So the, the scriptures do tell us that if there's sexual sin involved because the hardness of the man's heart and not being able to get past that, uh, God allowed for divorce and remarriage. And in 1 Corinthians 7, it says, if an unbelieving spouse leaves you, you're not bound to that marriage. Paul adds that on in the New Testament under the New Covenant because Jesus was speaking to Jews under the Old Covenant. In the New Covenant, Jesus said the Holy Spirit would guide us in all truth. And Paul says, if a non-believer leaves you, you're not bound to that marriage because God's called us to peace. Amen? However, our objective should be as much as possible to work things out, amen? Even if there's been infidelity in a marriage, you want to try to work that out, and you want to try to forgive and move on, okay, and, and grow. I've seen marriages, I've counseled people through that, and you wouldn't even know who they are. Their marriages are so blessed right now because it's long in the past, okay? God is the great redeemer, amen? He's the savior. He's the deliverer. He, he's the one who takes that which Satan means for evil and turns it for the good if we give it over to him, Amen? Now, notice that she's to be submissive to the Lord, but this whole thing starts with what? Fear God. Just like Ephesians 3.21, be submitted to one another in the fear of Christ. Very, very, very important that we understand this. That the husband may be one without a word. That means without a bunch of whining and complaining and, and nagging, but by being a good example and, and just following Jesus and being, and being right with the Lord and fearing Him. Amen? Now, I think it's interesting here because when a woman fears the Lord, she has great confidence because her confidence is then in God. And when a woman fears the Lord, she doesn't need to fear her husband in an ungodly way, amen? She realizes that he is ultimately in control. In fact, Proverbs 14, 26 says, in the fear of the Lord, listen to this, in the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence and his children will have a refuge. Sisters, if you're married to a husband that's not obedient to the word, pray for him because if he's rebelling against the word, he's hellbound. He's in big trouble. He is a miserable person, man. He's on, he's on a grease pole to hell if he's not following Jesus. He needs to get right. So you need to pray for him and be concerned about his soul. This is the man you married that you went to the altar because you love. Now, he may not be very loving right now, but guess what? He's lost and he needs Jesus if he's not obedient to the word. And your objective should be to win him to Christ. Amen? Now, you should be confident, though, and strong in the Lord. I think it's incredible because uh, it goes on to say in verses 2 and following, verse 2 says, as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. Why would you have chaste and respectful behavior even though your husband is disobedient to the word of God? Because you fear who? You fear and love God. You're not living first and foremost for your husband. You're living for God. And you treat your husband with respect because you love and fear God. And he's made in the image of God. He's the man you married, and you want to see him one to Christ. Verse 3, Your adornment must not be merely external braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. For in the same way in former times, the holy women also, who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves being submissive to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. Isn't that interesting? Because if you fear the Lord, what happens? You have confidence, and your husband cannot even ultimately hurt you. Because Jesus said, even if we got killed, not one hair on our head would perish, and he's numbered every hair, and we're more, more, he's more concerned about us than the sparrows, and he cares about the sparrows when they die. How much more does are valuable are you to him than the sparrows said Jesus amen so you, when you get right with God you're seeking him you get into his word you pour your heart into the Lord and seeking him you and you become friends with him the fear of the Lord is the friendship of the Lord guess what happens you realize guess what I love my husband but you see what state he's in and you realize that God's in control and he's sovereign amen and he ultimately will protect you I don't mean if your husband pulls a knife on you and and threaten you is that grounds for divorce well I know it's grounds for this call the cops and have them arrested okay 
because the Bible says to obey the laws. And if your husband's trying to kill you, you know, I can show you where Jesus ran from people that tried to kill him, okay? You're still following his steps at that point. Now, how many women are glad I threw that in? You got a little qualification there, okay? Goes for the men, too. I've seen men attacked by their wives, okay? Now, I'm not looking up, man, so uh, don't try to read my eyes. <laughs> uh, I'm kidding, halfway. Uh, now, if Sarah is the ideal example, because Abraham was a man of faith, but he faltered at times, right? I mean, I'm not kidding. I have different men in this fellowship that are sitting right here, different men that have come to me before, and different wives whose husbands and wives have mistreated them, okay? Even, uh, even physically, okay? Just on a couple occasions, okay? I'm not talking about knives or anything like that, okay? I, I, I can think of, you know, and it probably happens everywhere to one degree or another in the past, but I've seen God even rectify those types of situations, okay? Now, listen to this very carefully. If the woman, Sarah, is ideal example in the Old Testament, who's the example in the New Testament? I'm, I'm sorry, in the Old Testament. The Proverbs 31 woman, amen? Go to Proverbs chapter 31. And now, when you read the Proverbs 31 woman, I mean, how many of you have read that passage and are like, wow, look at this woman, man. She's like just I think it's amazing because Proverbs 31 closes with a crescendo of fireworks about this radical woman of God. And she is incredibly radical. She is incredibly uh, wonderful. And when we read in Proverbs chapter 31 about this woman, it says in verse 10, an excellent wife who can find. Check this out. An excellent wife who can find for her worth is far above jewels. And then you can read the description of her and say, well, I want to find a wife like this. But when you read the description, this is the woman that's married with kids. It's not the wife you're looking for. You're looking for a woman, if you're a man, that's like this woman before, you know, when she's not married, right? And if you're a woman looking at this woman, you would ask the same question. In fact, that's the first thing that would come to mind for women is that, well, I need to be more like this lady. How does this happen? And if I was to ask you, what's the outstanding quality? And there's so many things. We don't have time to go through everything about this woman because she, there's so many verses. It goes from verse 10 uh, uh, through most of the rest of the chapter talking about this woman, you know? The, tell, verse 31. That's, what, 22 verses, counting verse 20. That was too much to cover as far as exegeting the meaning of each verse. It's such a beautiful passage. So if we were to take one thing... Guess what? I know what the one thing is. You know what it is? You know what the one quality she has that is the foundation of all those other qualities? The fear of the Lord. That's right. In fact, go down to verse 30. Charm is deceitful and beauty is what? Vain. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Check that out. Charm is deceitful, beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. It's not all women. Don't get all wrapped up in charm and, and the outward person, as First Peter says. I mean, praise God, you want to be, uh, I'm, I'm not saying not to, you know, dress nicely and, you know, things of that nature, but what I am saying is that your main focus, as Peter says, should be the inner person, amen? That's what God's after. That's far more beautiful to God than anything on the outside. He looks at the heart. And charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. If a man marries a woman because she's just really beautiful on the outside, but she's without discretion, the Bible says that a woman that doesn't fear the Lord, a woman that, uh, you know, without discretion, is like a, uh, a, a jewel in a pig's snout, a waste of beauty, you know? This woman fears the Lord, man. She wants to do God's will. And I think it's really amazing when you consider the beauty of the, this woman and what this proverb goes on to say about her because it says all these wonderful things. In fact, look at verse 26. We'll only look at a few of them. Look at verse 26. Chapter 31, verse, verse 26. 
She opens her mouth in wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. Wow. Wow. She opens her mouth in wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. Why? Because she fears the Lord? Because she wants to be a blessing to others? Because she watches her tongue? She's not a gossip? She makes sure that she obeys the word of God. Instead of tearing people down, she builds them up in Christ because she fears the Lord. And the scriptures say a lot about the fear of the Lord in the tongue. In fact, the book that says more about the fear of the Lord and the tongue is the book of Proverbs than any other book. And so a woman who fears the Lord, she's careful in what she says. She's, she speaks beautifully to others. In fact, the scriptures say in Proverbs 25, a word uh, fitly spoken, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. Like a gold ring or ornament of gold is a wise reprover to a listener. She's a wise woman. The fear of the Lord leads to wisdom. She's to be praised because she fears the Lord. She has wise words to give other sisters, other brothers, to encourage them in the Lord, to encourage them in Jesus. She opens her mouth with wisdom. The teaching of kindness is on her tongue. I just love that. Look at verse 17 as well now. Verse 17. She girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. Look at verse 25. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she smiles at the future. Strength and dignity are her clothing. Folks, she's strong in the Lord and the power of his might. She has confidence. She fears God. Therefore, she's a strong woman because she's with the Lord. And one woman and Jesus together are a majority. Amen? And she recognizes and the Bible says to men and women to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, to put on the whole armor of God. Amen? So I love it. This, this woman is a bold, courageous woman. She's kind with her words. She's meek. But she's bold in who she is in Jesus. She's bold who she is, is, is who she is. In, she's not fearful of standing up for the Lord. She girds herself with strength. The Bible says to put on the whole armor of God. That's how you, to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Amen? Now I think it's incredible as well. Because if you look at the rest of verse 25, and I quoted the last part of it, but I'll just look at the last line. And she smiles at what? She smiles at the future. She's not all worried and freaked out about the future. Why? Because she fears the Lord, and the Lord is her sanctuary. She knows as long as she's fearing the Lord and loving the Lord, putting him first, right? He's going to protect her. He's going to take care of her, that she does not have to fear the future. And a lot of people are going to fear the future, and they, are, they, do right, they do right now. Jesus said people's hearts would be filling them for fear of things coming on the earth. But those who keep their eyes fixed on the Lord, the word says, are kept in perfect peace. Amen? So she's made the Lord her sanctuary. Therefore, she speaks godly words. Therefore, she puts on the armor of God. Therefore, she can look at the future and smile with confidence when all the world crumbles around her because she knows that her God is in control. Amen? What an awesome, awesome sister she is. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 3 says, A prudent person foresees danger and takes precautions. The simpleton goes blindly on and suffers the consequences. You see, those who are prudent, those who are wise, those who fear the Lord, prepare for the future in a godly manner. Hebrews eleven seven says, By faith Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark, for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Brothers and sisters, one of our objectives as believers is to what? Save our households. Amen? Bring them into the ark. Just as, as there was one door into the ark, there's one door into heaven. His name is Jesus. He is our ark. Amen? You have to point them to Jesus. Do what you can. You can't force. Kids are given free will. But you're to pray for them. You're to encourage them. You're to seek to lead them into righteousness. I love verses 11 and 12. Look at verse 11 and 12. The heart of the husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. Wow. Look at verse 27. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Look at this woman. She looks to the children, she, their household. She takes care of them. 
She blesses her husband, and her husband tr- trusts her. How could her husband trust her? Because if she fears God, he doesn't have to worry about her cheating on him. He doesn't have to worry about her making ungodly decisions. Amen? And she's a blessing to her husband, to her children, because she fears the Lord. Amen? You know, it's interesting. My wife, Lisa, you know, uh, when I was working on this message yesterday, I've been working on it off and on through the week pretty diligently, and I've worked on things respecting this message I'm finally giving for years, this whole concept. But as I was working on this, it nearly brought tears to my eyes. I just heard her, she was playing with uh, Eli in the next room or taking care of him, and all of a sudden, uh, my grandson, and all of a sudden she quoted the verse, you know, that a, a godly woman, you know, builds up her own household, but a foolish woman tears it down with her own hands. And I just lifted up my hands and gave thanks to the Lord that I got to have a godly wife that fears him. But it takes time. It takes time. I mean, when, when, I, was new, when I was newly married, and I deserved it, okay? Okay, because I spent too much time out front. Some guy came over that needed help, and I would, come, I would help him here and there, but he was beyond help, and I spent like two or three hours out there. And she said, you've been neglecting us. I'm in here and here just constantly. And we got into it. And I got her frustrated. You know how your husband's supposed to dwell with his wife in an understanding way? You know? I wasn't being very understanding. I was saying, we need to put God first, you know? And I have ministry to do. This person's in need. That person's refusing to follow Jesus. It was she, the person wasn't following Jesus at the time. And we got into it. And, and she popped me a little bit, you know? And oh, I can't believe how transparent and how honest you are. And a little blood came down from my lip. And then I looked out. We had a friend over. I think Aileen Paneri was there. Aileen, where are you? Aileen, where are you? Do you remember that? You remember that? I never even asked you if you saw that, man. Like, wow, man. So last week when we had Aileen over and this happened. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. This was years and years ago. And she's never done anything like that since, you know. And, uh, and I've been, but it was more me than her. Because I should have been understanding. Doing it with an understanding way. And I was, thought I was trying to be, hey, baby, you know. But uh, you know when there's certain times of the year, <laughs> you know, anyway, guess what? I'm just, <laughs> you know. But that's where the husband has to dwell with the wife in what? An understanding way. I should have been more understanding. I should say, you know what? I did spend a lot of time out there trying to reach this guy. And I could have said goodbye earlier. You know, I have a hard time doing that when I counsel sometimes too. And, uh, but you know what? We grow. Amen? We grow in the Lord. So when I said I'm not looking up, well, I was looking down because I was thinking to myself. <laughs> you know? Uh, but anyways, God works. And I can say right now, man, I've had a blessed. I was telling my wife recently, you know, I just thank the Lord that I have such a, w- a wife that fears the Lord, that loves the Lord. And I've seen her growth, you know? Wasn't perfect when I married her, and I was far from perfect too. And we're not perfect now. But you know what it says? It says in verse 28 of this Proverbs 31 woman, her children rise up and bless her, her husband also, and he praises her saying, many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. Wow. Charm is deceitful, beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the product of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. So husbands, praise your wives for fearing God. Amen? Amen? Wives, give thanks and encourage your husbands. Respect them for fearing God. We need to encourage each other in that. Sometimes we just point out when our spouse makes a mistake. But how about giving them a hug and saying, thank you for being such a blessing. Amen? We need to praise our spouses more when they're fearing and loving God. Amen? That's what we see here. This isn't just to show us the ideal godly woman and what she looks like, but also to encourage us men to praise our wives. And praise God for our wives. Amen. Important. Amen. Important stuff. So I encourage you to make sure that as sisters in the Lord, you're pursuing a godly life. Because we read in 1 Timothy chapter 5, in verses 11, 12, 
about a woman who's not following Christ, who turns away from Christ, it says, whose passions draw them away from Christ and thus, quote, incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. That's the English Standard Version. And verses 13 and 15 goes on to say of this kind of woman, besides that, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies, saying what they should not. So I, should, I, have, I would have the younger wi uh, widows marry, bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander, for some have already strayed after Satan. Wow. A woman that becomes a busybody, a gossip, going house to house, doesn't fear God, is not in the Word, not submitting to God, doing her own thing, actually abandons Christ, casts off her first faith, and becomes a follower of Satan. Guess what? Did you know there's more devil worshipers in the church than there are in the church of Satan? By thousands of times. Because the church of Satan is quite small. But there are all kinds of women and men whose hearts are not right with God. They're doing their own thing. And it says here, speaks of those who stray after Satan. That applies to men and women who aren't following the Lord, who are busybodies, gossips. Oh, they might go to church, but they're not submitted to God. They don't fear him. They don't love him. They don't follow his word. So churches have all kinds of people that are straying after Satan. Isn't that crazy when you think about it? That's because, again, Jesus said, he that's not with me is against me. Amen. Jesus said to religious leaders who did not submit to him that you are of your father the devil. We need to take this seriously, folks. This is serious stuff. So I encourage you to be a Proverbs 31 woman, amen? And again, what was the characteristic that underlied all her other characteristics? The fear of the Lord, amen? The fear of the Lord. Now go back to 1 Peter. Go back to 1 Peter chapter 3. And when you get there, I want you to go ahead and pick it up at verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. You husbands, now check this out, you husbands in the what? In the same way. Sound familiar? Verse 1, you wives in the same way. You husbands in the same way as what? In the same way as those servants, those slaves who had unreasonable masters. In the same way as Jesus who was nailed to the cross and didn't revile back. In the same way as wives who are to be submissive to ungodly husbands, verse 7, you husbands in the same way live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker, since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life. Hey, you're, you're not over her. Oh, you might have a leadership position, but that doesn't mean you're more valuable or not equal before God as far as human beings. In Christ, there's neither male nor female. Amen. But it says that you're to treat her with understanding as a fellow heir of the grace of life. She's a teammate in life with you. So that your prayers, and by the way, the very life that you have is by God's grace. Grace of life. So that Now look, look what it says at the very end. So that your prayers will not be what? Hindered. What does he mean by that? Your prayers, if you are not right with your wife, if you're not fearing God, chapter 2, verse 17, if you are not... Understand that even when your wife is unreasonable and you start to treat her harshly and meanly, refuse to love her and forgive her, and you're unmerciful to her, your prayers will be hindered. They won't get past the ceiling, folks. You'll be in huge trouble. In fact, it's interesting because look at what he goes on to say in verse 8. To sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. Not returning what? Evil for evil. That's talking, remember the example he gave us with Jesus? Not returning evil for evil or insult for insult. Just because your wife insults you, don't insult her back. Or if your husband insults you, don't insult him back. A soft answer turns away wrath, the Bible says. But giving a blessing instead. I love this. Listen to this. But giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. Isn't that awesome? God wants us to be blessed. And look at what verse 4 says. The one who desires life, to love life, or to love and see good days, some translations say love life, to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. I love this. God wants to bless us. He wants us to have a good and blessed life. That's his heart for all of us. That's good. Look at verse 11. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are toward who? The righteous. And his ears attend to what? Their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who what? 
to evil. What's he telling us right there? Husbands, your, your, your prayers will be hindered. Your prayers will be hindered. For the Lord turns his face against those who do evil if you do not dwell with your wife in an understanding and loving way. And he will not hear your prayers. It says it quite clearly right there. Why will he not forgive, hear your prayers? Because guess what? You have been a rebellious wife at times. Husband, yes. Not to your wife, but to your God. Every time we fall short, we are a rebellious bride to him. We're the bride of Christ. And the Lord says that he knows that we are made of dust and that our frames are weak. And he has mercy on us if we come to him. Amen? And he's already merciful toward us when we're in rebellion, hoping that we'll turn back. And if we, as his bride, can be forgiven, and he has a forgiving attitude and a desire for us to be right with him, and he's not evil toward us at all, God is never evil toward us, how much more should husbands recognize that their wives are in the same state and be forgiving and merciful toward them? In fact, after Peter asked the Lord, remember? I mean, why would their prayers be hindered? After Peter asked the Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother? Up to 70 times. Jesus said, what, 70 times seven? And then he illustrated, and he talked about a man. Remember that story? He gave an illustration about an unmerciful servant who after he'd been forgiven, what would be equivalent to 10,000 lifetimes of debt, he refused to forgive someone who, forgave him, who, who owed him far less, and he started choking that person. And then we read, Then his master summoned him and said to him, this is Matthew 18, 32 through 35, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he could pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Wow. Just as this master threw him to be tormented until he could pay it back, which he never could. So Jesus says to Peter and the other apostles, so your heavenly Father will do to you if you become a wicked servant and you don't forgive your brother from your heart. And Jesus, over and over again, emphasized this principle that if we refuse to forgive others and we want to enact vengeance on them, and that's our heart toward them, that we won't be forgiven either. God won't answer our prayers. In fact, Jesus, after he said, pray, Father, forgive us as we, for as we forgive those who sin against us. That's the way we're asking God to forgive us as we forgive others the same way. He says in Matthew 6, 14 and 15, for if you forgive others their tresp trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you says Jesus, but if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. In Mark eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus says this, listen to this, and when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Wow. Luke six thirty seven. judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. James 2.13, for judgment is without mercy. Judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. I want to be a merciful person. Amen? I want God's mercy, and I want to be like the Lord, and I want to be merciful. But if we are unforgiving, un, uh, treacherously, the Bible says not to deal harshly with your wives. If we deal harshly with our wives and treacherously with our wives, he won't accept our prayers. He won't accept our offerings. He won't accept... In fact, Malachi chapter 2, verses 13 through 16 says this. This is another thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears. These people are going to God's altar and they're actually bawling. With weeping and with groaning because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. Why? Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth. Isn't this heavy? against whom you have dealt treacherously, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. But not one has done so who has a remnant of the Spirit. And what did that one do while he was seeking a godly offspring? See, God wants godly offspring. That's another reason you treat your wives right. Take heed then to your spirit, and let no one deal treacherously against the wife of your youth. For I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel, and him who covers his garment with wrong says the Lord of hosts. So take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. You see what these folks were doing, these men? They saw these pagan women that were younger, and they were beautiful young women, and they wanted them. So they divorced their wives. 
as they got older and their wives were being left destitute, left without a husband. They were dealing treacherously with them. And these men were, reckon, were wondering why their lives, and this is what happens when you rebel against the Lord, why their lives were just going downward spiral. So they go to the, the altar, Lord, they start crying and giving offerings to God. God, accept our prayers. And God says, your garment is covered with wrong. It stink, stinks to high heaven, basically, you know? And you want forgiveness and mercy and love, but you're refusing to go back to your wife. Now, I recognize the, the biblical grounds for divorce, as I've said. And even if someone's been divorced years ago, if someone divorces, I'm sorry, this is the biblical teaching. If a man divorces his wife and, she's, and he has no grounds, and then three years goes by and she's still waiting for him to come back and she hasn't remarried and she wants to be restored, I'm not talking about if she's remarried because then there is grounds for divorce because that would be sexual sin. Whoever does it first, and boom, there's grounds for divorce right there. But if she's waiting for that man... Three, five, seven years later, you know what? He cannot remarry. He has to go back to that wife that's waiting. Otherwise, you know, that God hates it when a husband and wife marry and then one leaves the other without grounds and just, you know, lets her flounder, destitute, or vice versa. A woman leaves a man, divorced, and she doesn't have grounds, but she just likes another guy. It's not right. It's not good, okay? And we have to be careful how we treat each other, Amen. Husbands, you need to take this really, really seriously, that you do not deal treacherously with your wives, that you do not deal harshly with your wife. Amen? You know, you need a purpose in your heart to have a loving relationship with your wife, and even if there's a disagreement, you need to be able to say, hey, you know, let's try to work this out. You need to be able to give your wife a hug. There, needs to be a, there should be a softness between the two of you. And when there's a problem, there's a situation that causes division in your relationship, you need to go before the Lord and ask Him for forgiveness and say, God, give me strength to love my wife. He'll hear that kind of prayer. Lord, I want to deal righteously with my wife. Forgive me and help me be a blessing to her. And vice versa, from the wife to the husband, amen? You don't want to deal treacherously with your husband. Say, oh, wow, I saw all the verses in Proverbs 31 and First Peter, but I didn't see, I couldn't deal treacherously with him. Yeah, we did see that. If he's unreasonable, you're still supposed to be what? A good, humble example before him, amen? That you could win him to Christ, amen? We ran out of time. But did you get the message? Are we going to seek to have God-fearing messages, uh, God-fearing uh, marriages? Can you see how the fear of God in the marriage can just beautify it? Amen? When two people, a husband and wife, both love and fear God together, right? The sky's the limit in regard to blessing that comes in the Lord. Their household will be blessed. Their children will be like a garden before them. And they themselves will be a precious garden. And they'll be just the harvest of righteousness for which God deserves all the glory. I want to encourage you all in Jesus to fear God whether you're married or not because when you fear the Lord, He's your sanctuary, amen? He's your blessing. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the fear of the Lord lasts forever. Let's all please stand. Let's pass out the cup and the bread.